Why do you feel that you are being targeted for recall? What do you think is behind this? Well, let's be really clear about the chronology, Anna. They registered the domain website for the recall the week I was sworn into office. They literally started Twitter feeds and recall efforts before I'd implemented a single policy. Um, and I've been dealing with recalls or attempted recalls for more than half the time I've been in office. This has far less to do with any specific policy that I've implemented and far more to do with the fact that the Republican Party and major national Republican donors who are bankrolling this effort were unhappy with the outcome of the 2019 election and are determined to undermine the free and fair democratic process that occurred here in San Francisco, determined to roll back the clock and to undo the kinds of reforms that I've made that I promised voters I would make that you've been describing. Things like our worker protection unit that you mentioned, things like meaningful police accountability, things like reducing juvenile incarceration or creating an independent innocence commission to ensure that people who were wrongfully convicted are not languishing behind bars. Those are policies that are consistent with San Francisco values and I'm proud of my record in implementing them. So let's talk about uh, how San Francisco voters feel. Uh, there was actually a poll released today that uh, doesn't look good. It was conducted by a market research firm, EMC Research. And they found that 68% of likely primary voters say they will vote yes to recall Boudin. Uh, that number includes 64% of registered Democrats. Uh, in fact, a total of 74% have an unfavorable opinion of you, with 59% of voters overall having a strongly unfavorable opinion. 61% agree that you are responsible for rising crime rates in San Francisco, especially burglaries and thefts. Considering the fact that the majority, a clear majority of Democratic voters in San Francisco agree that um, your soft on crime policies are a problem. You know, how do you respond to that? How do you uh, persuade them otherwise? Well, there's a lot there to unpack, Anna. So let's start with the basics. This poll was paid for by the recall and it was released by the recall weeks, if not months after the actual survey was done. Uh, precisely because they wanted to get folks like you talking about it. Uh, we uh, have seen polls that are more recent that put us neck and neck. Um, I feel good about the progress we're making and the direction we're going in the campaign. But here's the other thing to recognize. Um, we, we know that people all across the country are increasingly concerned about public safety issues and crime. That's not unique to San Francisco. And my policies are anything but soft on crime. I wanna be clear, under my leadership, conviction rates for Homicide cases have increased, charging rates for drug sales and for sexual assaults have increased. And we are being creative, proactive and innovative in the ways in which we hold people who commit crimes in San Francisco accountable. More importantly, empirical evidence, data, hard numbers show that overall San Francisco is safer on a relative basis than neighboring cities like Oakland or places like Sacramento, where they do have tough on crime so-called prosecutors. Uh, we are doing what's smart on crime. We're being proactive about holding people who commit crimes accountable. And San Francisco has lower violent crime rates and lower property crime rates than any uh, time in the last five years. No question, the pandemic has been uh, tremendously difficult for all of us. It has put local government and local businesses and local communities to the test in ways none of us could have predicted when I ran for office in 2019. So and there's a tremendous amount of outrage and frustration from our voters. And my office and I are working as hard as we can to ensure that everybody in San Francisco is safe and feels safe. So Chesa, I, I did look into the methodology of that poll because I'm always suspicious of polls, <laughs> especially, and I knew that it was a very likely commissioned uh, by the individuals trying to recall you. Uh, but we have to be fair and honest, uh, the poll was conducted in the first week of March. So it wasn't conducted months and months ago, um, but you know. That, that's not what I read in the paper. They didn't share the poll results with, results with me Anna, but I read in the paper that it was done in February. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I know this same, um, the same kind of approach to polls would have suggested that Larry Elder was gonna be governor of the state of California. And thankfully the polls that had him beating uh, Governor Newsom were way off.
Fair enough. So uh, let's move on to uh, some of the decisions you made as soon as you were uh, sworn in. You know, the first thing that really raised eyebrows was your decision to immediately fire seven prosecutors within your office. Since then, dozens of lawyers working for the prosecutor's office uh, have also decided to resign, many of whom did so quietly. A few of whom did not do so quietly and decided to join the recall effort against you. We'll get to that later. Um, but the argument is that they were then replaced with career defense attorneys, individuals who aren't necessarily trained in being prosecutors. And and what is your response to that? Well, it, it omits key facts, including that I've hired nearly a dozen people who used to be employed by the office, left under prior administrations, and then were eager to come back and join my administration. We've got people from all walks of life, different genders and racial backgrounds and language groups who were prosecutors in this office, left and now came back to work under me and my administration. I am proud of the folks we've recruited to come to our office, including, yes, some former defense attorneys who have a really good history of litigation, of understanding how to anticipate the kinds of arguments that we'll see in cases. But also of folks who um, came from other district attorney's offices all around the state. Um, The truth is we've been overwhelmed by the quality and the quantity of applications we've received. And I'm proud of the folks that we've hired, Uh, new energy, new ideas, um, and folks who are really eager to serve and help protect the people in the city of County of San Francisco. So I want to get to some of the statistics that you published. Um, you know, I, I really think it's great that you're transparent in regard to uh, your prosecutorial work. You publish data about it, um, and it was recently analyzed by the San Francisco Chronicle in a piece uh, written by Susie Nielsen. And she writes that based on the data that you shared, uh, Boudin has sent a greater percentage of defendants in robbery, assault, and drug cases to diversion programs than his predecessor, who was Gascon, who by the way is facing his own recall effort here in California. Boudin's office has also more frequently charged defendants with crimes that are less serious than those sought by police officers after robbery and assault arrests. They find that the district attorney's office files charges in cases brought by police, finding that Boudin's charging rates were in fact higher than Gascon's in narcotics and homicide cases, but lower for lesser offenses such as petty theft. Overall, Boudin's charging rate was 48%, and it was actually lower than Gascon's 54% in his last two years in the same office. And so, the results are a little mixed. What is your response to that? Especially when it comes to, honestly, what I would argue are violent crimes that end up getting sent to these diversion programs. Like I, I think it's insane that assault or robbery is not considered a violent crime. Well, robbery is considered a violent crime under California law, and assault is, depending on the particulars, the details, it can be a violent crime or a nonviolent crime, depending on the facts. Uh, But really what's at issue here is me and my office following through on what we promised voters we would do and on what state law requires. So let me be clear about what I mean when I say that. First of all, my commitment to voters in San Francisco was to expand access to diversion precisely because it is a more effective way to hold low level offenders accountable, a more effective way to break the cycle of recidivism or or re-arrest that have so defined America's failed approach to criminal justice. And that's not something that's specific to San Francisco or California. That failure, those horrific rearrest rates are something that we see from coast to coast, from north to south. So when I ran in 2019, I said to voters, we're gonna ensure that people who are committing crimes because of their addiction or their homelessness or their mental illness are required, court mandated to engage with services that can ensure public safety in the future. And we're gonna double down our efforts to hold those accused of the most serious crimes like murder and sexual assault accountable. That's exactly what those numbers show. But there's another two factors that are really critical changes that have happened in the last two years. The first one is new state laws, not my policies or out of San Francisco County, but state laws that were signed into law by the governor, which created and expanded diversion programs. That's beyond the scope of any one county or elected district attorney, Mm -hmm. when those programs exist, judges will often send people to them. Many of them didn't exist two years ago. And the other thing that's critical to remember is you're evaluating my record when I've been in office for two years, one of which was entirely defined 
by the COVID-19 pandemic and court shutdowns. So you are absolutely right. In 2020, we made difficult decisions not to charge lower level cases precisely because our courtrooms were closed. We had limited bandwidth and we needed to prioritize holding people accountable who committed serious and violent crimes. You know, one thing that I want clear and fair enough, I think your point about the pandemic is a relevant and substantive one. But there's one point that I need a little bit more clarification on because according to the San Francisco Chronicles analysis, they also show that your office is sending a larger share of defendants in robberies to these diversion programs. Is that true? I mean, they're basing it off of the data that you've published. And if that is the case, is there any evidence showing that these individuals are not repeat offenders? Absolutely, first of all, robberies can look a lot of different ways. And in in California, some of the cases we see that get booked into custody as robberies are essentially shoplifting cases where a loss prevention officer may have felt fear or where some level of force was used in a tug of war, for example, over a bag of stolen items. That's a very different robbery from an armed robbery with a firearm where someone is is physically injured in the process. Now, under California law, all of those may qualify as robberies. So to, to look at what we're sending to diversion, no, we are not sending large numbers of cases that are violent armed robberies to diversion, absolutely not. Uh, but we do have state laws that make certain categories of offense and offenders eligible for diversion. And we know, for example, from our Make It Right program, which is a program that's been in place for several years in our juvenile courts, that when we give victims the option of whether they wanna see the person who robbed them prosecuted using traditional tools, or whether they wanna see them go through a restorative diversion program. The overwhelming majority of victims have asked that we go through the restorative diversion path. And critically, we see far fewer rearrest rates or rates of repeat offenders when young people successfully complete that program than we see with the same cohort, the people sit charged with the same crimes who go through a traditional prosecution. We did that research in partnership with outside independent researchers. We did a blind AB study where we randomly assigned people to control groups over a multi-year period. And we were so impressed by the effect that these diversion and restorative programs had on reducing rearrest rates that we've significantly expanded them. And the data you're citing is a reflection of exactly what our longitudinal study showed, that these programs are far more effective at reducing recidivism, at protecting public safety, and critically, at leaving victims feeling satisfied and empowered than our more traditional approaches to many of these cases are. Then how do you explain the significant uptick in crime? I mean, it's it's pretty difficult to ignore. Um, you know, you might make the argument that your policies uh, aren't contributing to it, but how can you show clearly that that's really the case? Like what data can you point to? Um, and, and how are you using that to, to inform your decisions moving forward when it comes to either using diversion programs or approving someone for no cash bail? Well, first of all, overall crime has gone down in the two years since I've been in office in San Francisco. So when we look at data, it's not about ignoring data, it's about looking at data, as you say. And I, I hope you'll take a look at what the San Francisco Police Department crime dashboard shows. If you compare reported crime in 2019, the year before I took office with reported crime in 2020 or 2021, you'll see that overall reported crime is lower in every year that I've been in office than it was in the year prior to me taking office. Now, look, those statistics don't mean anything if you or someone you care about have been a victim of crime. And I know that there are still far too many crimes committed in San Francisco. But it is not my job or the job of the San Francisco District Attorney's Office to make arrests. We rely on the San Francisco Police Department to respond to 911 calls, to investigate, to make arrests where appropriate, and to bring us their investigation. And what I can tell you is that when police bring us investigations, we file charges, we hold people accountable, and we do it in ways, as you pointed out earlier, Anna, that are transparent, that are consistent with San Francisco values, and that are um, applying new state laws that are aimed at ensuring we're as effective and as humane and as efficient as possible at breaking the cycle of recidivism that has so defined counties like Sacramento where you've got traditional tough on crime prosecutors and where, and this is important Anna, in the last two years we've seen crime rates skyrocket in those jurisdictions. In fact, across the state of California, 
If you compare crime rates in the last two years from red counties to blue counties, red counties are doing far worse in terms of murder, armed robbery, and pretty much every single category of crime. We've got work to do in San Francisco, but let's be clear, we are doing far better than Oakland, a city across the bay with a murder rate four times the one we have in San Francisco. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.